<laughs> well, welcome everyone. We're glad you're here. And uh, for part four, our last and final installment in this journey that we've taken with this growth multiplier event series. And um, really, really fun to have you guys here. And hopefully you've been getting the emails and the recordings and been able to keep up along the journey along the way with us. Uh, just as some context really quick for 30 seconds why we're here and then what we've covered. Why we're here because, you know, Jimmy and I both have a passion to help people grow. And we've done that in different domains, personal transformation and leadership, and then Jimmy, leadership, personal transformation, sales, helping organizations grow. And as we've brought these two together, what we've said to the world with this is, hey, we know that companies need operating systems. We know that they need different places that they're helped, but we want to serve through taking them through the components that help them deliver repeatable, predictable growth, specifically in four areas that make up the whole growth engine of their company. First, we talked about the growth of the leader. Then we looked at what it means to understand how that is translated in the team. And then third, we talked about what it looks like to keep the culture always advancing and growing. That was our last installment. And so today, Jimmy, we get to hit the fourth component, which is nachos, right? That's right. <laughs> I must be getting hungry. Many layers, baby, many layers. <laughs> so, uh, so man, as you, as you take it away, tell us about that fourth component and what we want to make sure that we have dialed in and we can have that repeatable, predictable growth occur. Yeah. Well, it's the, it's the component that's missing, which is action, right? So uh, when we think about what started us off, this idea of leadership, we started by talking about uh, growth as the mastery of change and the role of the leader to bring that mastery, not only to the organization, but to the team that they're leading. Uh, it's the mastery, right, that is the mystery of um, what we're trying to achieve here, um, the mystery of what it takes to be that effective leader. Um, as we develop that mastery, it, is, it becomes an attractive force which attracts people to us. We start to create leverage among the people we attract to us and build that team. And as that team grows, the team takes on an identity of its own, which we call culture. Now what we have to do is we have to move this amazing organization that we've built to action. Right, so keeping this theme that growth is the mastery of change, right? We are facing change now at organizational level. We're facing a change at team level. We're facing changes at individual levels. And we have to address all of that in a way that aligns us with the overall vision of the organization, uh, what's happening in the marketplace, and all the other permuta permutations that. Uh, that occur within the organization. And it can feel daunting and um, overwhelming when we think of it that way. Most of us, instead of thinking of it that way, just show up and we respond and just get shit done. <laughs> and, you know, even strategic planning is a function of the oh shit moment. Like, ah, our plan ain't working, what do we do? Um, and we're reacting or responding. Uh, few of us or few leaders in organizations are expected to and have the ability to look forward and be really thoughtful about <clears throat> what may come to anticipate the change. And instead of uh, being becoming really good at responding, they are anticipating and actually possibly even leading and creating the change and innovation that their company then adopts and that leapfrogs them into the market, takes them where they want to go. So it's important for us to do in this action stage, this action conversation is to share a framework as we have done in the other, in the previous three conversations that can help you as a leader think about how to move people to action in the context of what might be important to that individual member on your team, in the context of what you might wanna create for your team in the context of the goals that are given to you by the organization, right, that flow down to you. These are goals that you may or may not have any control over, but they're just handed off to you and you're told, look, in order for the organization to achieve its objectives, here's what I need you to achieve. 
and now you've got to make the adjustments. And it could also, this, this uh, contact, this formula could also apply in the context of the organization as a whole. I know it's a lot, of, lot to bite off, but that's what we're going to talk about today, Chris. Does that make sense? Yeah. I mean, you know, for me, the test is, I think what we were talking about when we opened up, <clears throat> uh, just catching up, you know, what's it look like when, when change is happening? Does it even apply to a personal change? Like what I was talking about with my daughter, the little girl going away. Now it doesn't snuggle on the couch as much. And so for me, you know, the, the test so often happens, even in those personal situations, that's how you know you have something that's profound, something truth, uh, because it maps wherever you apply it. So take right. us there, man. Right, right. So let's think about, let's think about um, this idea that growth is what the organization wants from us. Growth is what each individual member of our, member of our team wants from us. Uh, growth is the mastery of change. Mastery is something that's cultivated. We all have different degrees of mastery and the leader is expected to bring a level of mastery that can serve the organization and that can also serve the members of their team. And the members of the team um, respect or pursue that mastery because it fills a gap for them. Uh, that mastery is there to, uh, to help them get to where they wanna be. Um, what, what causes us to seek leaders is the fact that change is inevitable, but growth is not, right? So there is a, there is fear, uncertainty, and doubt. There's a question, there's risk associated with change. And we tend to be attracted to leaders who bring the, a level of mastery that reduces the risk or increases the probability of success. And so we have a lot to learn from those folks. And it's one reason in that context why we tend to, or I tend to define leadership as the transfer of mastery. Um, leaders have all kinds of goals, but at the end of the day, that one-to-one -one relationship between the leader and the member of their team who has decided that that leadership is valuable to them, that relationship includes that transfer of mastery, uh, the transfer of a path that both folks, because, because of their shared goal, can walk together to success. Uh, this idea of transferring mastery also is consistent with the idea, I know the Chris that you talk about a lot, which is the, the primary goal of, of a leader is to create other leaders. And so by providing this transfer and uh, a methodology, we can empower the folks around us and help them grow. So what's the formula? Uh, well, what's really interesting is uh, we kind of think about this idea, uh, uh, the model in the context of change. Are we ready, willing, and able to embrace the change? And we've taken this idea of being ready, willing, and able to embrace the change uh, and formulated a, a model uh, asking the question, you know, what is the agreement that we have to achieve that makes us ready for change? And I'm gonna apply this in multiple ways. And I think it's powerful when you start to apply the model, but I'm just gonna share it with you off the bat. What makes us ready for change typically is this a desire that we have to achieve something, a vision that we have, a goal that we have that um, is standing before us. And that goal could be in response to uh, an event that's occurred in the marketplace, or it could simply be in response to a desire that we have for growth. But it's a, it's a desire or a vision or a goal, I call it a want, that, um, that is important to me as an individual. Uh, what, what's next is, in order for me to understand that that desire is something that's worthwhile investing in, there has to be a case for this, for me to pursue this. There has to be an impact that is worthy enough of me making the investment in that shift. Uh, and so uh, the first question is why change? Because I want something I don't have. The second question is why now? Because the impact of making that shift is too great to ignore. The third question is, well, why do it? Why make it happen? Because there's a, why make the investment? Because there's something I'm missing, right? There's a need that I don't, that I need to have fulfilled. And that need is typically brought to me vis-a-vis -vis the leader that I end up pursuing or end up working with. And then the next and the last question is, uh, well, why you? Why you as a leader? It's because the leader brings a full package to the table 
that uh, that can help me get to where I want to be. So what's interesting about this is, and, and think about the context that this would you would use this in as a leader in an organization. Think about you seeing a problem inside the organization, um, developing a solution, and then presenting that solution to the people you think should be hearing it. What is the typical response? Um, oftentimes, um, you're going to get pushback because all they're hearing from you is the solution. You haven't yet set the stage for the problem that you're attempting to solve. So what, what's interesting about this model is the win, the want, impact, and need helps to frame the challenge of the problem that you're addressing as a leader, right? That path to change, that path to growth that has to be walked. Uh, if you can do that first and then present your solution, then you have a better chance of engaging the organization by describing the problem and then helping them understand the path that you've designed to the solution. You've helped them understand the path to mastery that you're presenting to them as a leader. Um, what's also very interesting is if you have someone in your organization come to you with a challenge and they come to you with the solution ready to rock and roll, you can help them um, understand the value of that solution moving to action by, by um, deconstructing the problem that they think they've identified, right? So what is it that we are after? What's the ultimate goal or vision that you want to achieve? What is it that you want? What is the reason for change in the first place, right? What is the impact of success, failure, or doing nothing, right? What will that bring to us as an organization, as a team, or to you as an individual? What's missing for you? Why can't you achieve that already? Why do you need to bring this to me? Why do we need to uh, make the shift as an organization? Why can't you achieve this on your own? What are you missing? And then, and then we can explore the potential of the solution that we can bring to you as an, as an organization or that I can bring to you as an individual leader. But what's nice about this model is before we take action, we're able to understand uh, the, the, the problem in its entirety. What is it that we're trying to achieve? What is the impact of success or failure and what is missing? That now frames our focus and then can develop a solution for us that can move us to action. When I, when I first heard you talk through this, uh, you know, in, way back now, 50, 70 years ago, mm -hmm. the, um, you used an example with getting your child to wear a bike helmet. Right. Uh, and Very now, it, yeah. Would you mind walking through your, yeah. what you just presented with that story? And then I'll, I, I want to make a point to that, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Well, it's a, it's a great story because it, it talks about, the choices that we have as leaders who want to facilitate or initiate change inside an organization. As leaders, we have uh, two options, right? We can, we can motivate the organization uh, to change, to, to, to follow us because they see the vision that we see. We can also uh, motivate our organization through fear. We can just dominate them and tell them by leveraging the power in our position that they have no other choice to follow us. And the consequence is a fear-based consequence of either losing some kind of political status or losing respect or worst case being let go. So we have those two options. As parents, <laughs> which, which of the two options do we default to? Because I said so, or do we help create a, um, a message, uh, do we help articulate the challenge, the problem that we face and our, the solution we're bringing to the table in a way that um, helps the person we're looking to motivate see the shared goal and then embrace the shared path that we're bringing to them. So the story that Chris is talking about is one where um, I use this model to help my uh, youngest daughter understand the value of wearing her helmet while riding a bike. Um, and now one of the things that I also talk a lot about is that you can leverage this model to match your personality. My personality is a more aggressive personality. So I'm going to tell you the story. You'll have to <laughs> understand it, understanding the context that I bring to the table. Um, for those of you who know me, this will not surprise you. I think for anybody that may not know you, nobody's going, he's such a hippie laid back dude. Yeah, There's no thanks. way he's aggressive. 
<laughs> so, and I love my kids. So I'm going to be as, you know, I'm, I'm always going to default to being as supportive of my kids as possible. But my daughter, eight years old, um, you know, I want to, I want to, I want to have a conversation with her about wearing her helmet while riding a bike. And the question back to me is, dad, why do I have to wear a helmet? Uh, why are, so the question was, why are we even having this conversation? And the, and I start with this idea of a shared vision, a shared goal. And I thought to myself, what is my goal for her? Is it for her to wear the helmet? No, that's the, that's the, that's the solution. That's the action. What I want is health. The, the big want, the reason to change is to, is to preserve her health so that she has a long and wonderful life. Um, and what I, what I, and so my first objective is, th is to make sure that that's a shared objective for her and I. So the, the way that I address the question about why wear the helmet is, honey, I, I just simply said to her, because I had to get to the point quickly, she's eight, she has, does not have a great attention span. Honey, what would, how many times would you have to fall off your bike and crack your head on the curb before you couldn't ride your bike anymore. And she thought about it. While she was thinking, I kept going because I had her, right? Honey, how many times do you think you have to fall off your bike and crack your head on the curb before you can't walk anymore? Before you can't dance anymore, right? She loved to dance at that time. And it, it posed a question and it triggered this question for her about a practice that she, was, that she had, right, that was not going to preserve her health that had that created risk for her. And I combine that with the impact question about what would that mean? It would mean I couldn't walk, run, play with my friends. It, mean, it would mean that I couldn't do what I love to do most, which is dance, right? And so I, and so I asked her, what's missing? Well, I mean, I, and she starts ideating. Well, I have to improve my safety. What can I do, dad? I don't know. Well, how would you protect your head if you fell off your bike? right? Helmet. If you had to buy a helmet, what would it look like? We start talking about it. What would stop you from wearing the helmet? Well, I don't know, dad, nothing. I mean, my health is so important. Well, what if your friends start to make fun of you? And she, and she started thinking, now, why would I have the conversation now? Because I know what's going to happen. She puts the helmet on, her friends make fun of her. As soon as she turns the corner, she takes it off, throws it in the woods, and we're done. So, you know, as a leader of change, as a change agent in my organization, I want to explore all the reasons why it won't work. Not, you know, for not, I don't want to simply just push my idea through and get the yes. I want to make this sustainable. Um, and so we, we faced the challenge. What, how would you respond? And we had that conversation. The people making fun of you, is it possible that they want the same thing you do? Health. Is it possible that they would see why you're wearing the helmet after they got done making fun of you? Yes. Is it possible that you could be a leader inside your group of friends to help them see the value of preserving their health? Yes. So instead of the helmet being something that was going to attract negative attention, the helmet was actually this beacon, this light that gave an example of how she could help lead her friends to thinking, to making better decisions about how they might be healthy, stay healthy. What I didn't do to have that conversation with her was I didn't go out and buy the helmet and I would have gone out and bought a black helmet, you know, basic straps, brought it home and said, here, wear this. How many of us as leaders do that to our team? Here, use this, here, implement this. What's the problem with that? There's, enormous numbers of problems. I gave you one example of the problem, right? We're going to create conflict and they're going to say yes to us because of, they're afraid of us or they'll say yes to us and ignore us. The other challenge here is it makes our job as leaders more difficult, right? If I have to, as a leader, see the problem and then come up with a, come up with a solution and then sell my team on it, that makes my life a living hell and it compounds my life as a leader. I have to do that for all 13, 30, 40, 100 people on my team. Forget about it. It's, it's impossible. I'm not creating leverage, something we talked about in session two, the core component of building a team. So by identifying challenges and bringing those to the team and then walking them through a process that helps the team ideate, first, define the problem. Second, think about the solution. 
is one that um, works really well. It creates yeah. lots of solutions for the, for the leader. You know, it, it makes me think of like where, let's say we're helping a team and the leader of the team, typically the business owner executive says, well, I got to sell this to my team. Right. You know, or, <laughs> or they don't say anything. And, and both of those are concerning because on one end, they don't say anything. And it's like, you know, they just tell them what it is. And, and so there's possibility that there's a low ownership culture on the team or I got to sell it to my team. You know, yeah. Well, let's talk about how often do you really need to be doing that? I mean, you don't need to be selling everything. That's like you're saying, it's exhausting. You've got to get up and, and burn the strategy and the vision in their heart in a fresh way. But you're doing that once, you know, three times a year, super effectively, it resonates emotionally. And then they keep coming back to it. You, you can still give them reminders, but that's what happens when you walk people through a process. Um, I want to ask a question, but I want to make a comment on something real quick. For people that have been with us through this journey, these four parts, for anybody that draws it out, what you just laid out, the wins, W-I-N-S, they'll notice that's a circle. And, uh, you know, part of what I've seen so much transformation with and the people that we work with as leaders is because we're not teaching you an amateurish beginner way to change your life, which is just loosely applied principles. It's not actually a pro level leader, leadership level either, because it's not optimizing all the perfect conditions. It is a true mastery level, which means it's got to be something elegant, fluid, dynamic that maps onto your life and customizes to wherever you are. Uh, and that's why we both, I know, resonated with that phrase. The, I shared it with you. You were like, dude, I have that hanging up. I think you have it hanging up, that uh, Cherokee proverb, all truth is a circle. Right. Um, and that's this idea that the deepest, most profound transformational processes in all the ancient wisdom traditions, you know, around the globe where they recorded anything for thousands of years, you've got a rhythm that's happening. It's like a circle. And so I think it's super fascinating that each of us independently, as we take people to mastery in specific domains, have a process of a circle that we take people through. And then what we've done with Growth Multiplier in marrying those together are these four essential components for what it means to, to have predictable growth. Predictable growth for the leader, the team, the culture, and now what it means to take that out into the strategic action of the organization. So for those paying attention, you know, I just pulling back the curtain on that a little bit. What would you say uh, for people right now that are facing an issue where people don't engage the process, right? They, they're being stubborn, they're locked in, defensive, passively avoiding, uh, you know, right. it's not hard to imagine your eight-year-old daughter being like, I don't want to talk about a dad. I mean, give her five years in that response, but yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. I mean, yeah, if you, let's use that eight-year-old. I mean, I don't want to talk about that. Then you say, fine, right? Let's not talk about it. Or you could say, fine, let's not talk about it. When will you be ready, right? So as you, you know, and the folks listening who have been through training as leadership training or development as a coach, you know, you can't coach someone who doesn't want to be coached. You can't help someone who doesn't want to be helped, right? At that moment, you have a choice to make. Am I going to preserve the circle that you've talked about, right? All life is a circle, the cycle, or am I going to go against it by doing something dumb like using force to make this happen? We don't need to default to force or to fear to create change, right? What if she, what if she says, though, I'm going to go ride my bike? Yeah, we can talk about it later. Because I love the question where right. you say, when do you want to talk about it? That's awesome. But yeah, she goes, I don't want to talk about it. I'm going to go ride my bike. <laughs> right. So the thing that we've done with our kids, and I'm not saying that we're perfect parents, but the thing that we've done with our kids is we've put the responsibility on them, right? So when you say to somebody, when, when they say, I don't want to wear my helmet, my daughter, you know, dad, the argument you made yesterday made sense. Today doesn't make sense to me. I don't want to wear it. Okay, great. The, well, the decision's yours, but you have to live with the consequence. Now, an eight-year-old isn't going to understand consequence unless they're reminded. 
So you have to help them. Some adults don't, right? But we have That's to- That's where I was headed next. <laughs> we have to help our teammates. And so these are, for leaders, these are individualized conversations, but you cannot short circuit this process. You cannot skip the, re, the, the you can't skip the four agreements. The first agreement is why I change because I want something I don't have. You can't go from that right to the solution to your leadership and say, well, you know, eat this, take this, do this. When you skip steps, it might feel like you're getting there faster because you feel better because you're frustrated or whatever reason you're in a hurry, but it, it, it kills the circle. It breaks the circle. It breaks the relationship. And you're not doing the thing that's most important, which is um, developing your people as leaders. The implication of leveraging this model, the four agreements, is that you develop your people as leaders. I develop my daughter's way of thinking and solving challenges so she can do it when I'm not there. If you leverage this model with your team, you're teaching them to do it when you're not there. You're, you're accentuating the leverage in that team and you're doing what we promise in this entire program, you're becoming a growth multiplier, a force multiplier. You're creating leverage. A lever is you know, the ultimate multiplier, right? And so by, by breaking that down and being lazy and impatient and using force or fear, you're not leveraging the cycle or a circle that can, that can take the investment you're making and create that significant leverage among your teammates and within your family. And so, yeah, I have to remind my eight-year-old the conversation we had. I have to walk her through the, the, re, the, the agreements that we set, the reason to change, the reason to do it now, right? What was missing? The helmet, right? So, or so a safety device. Yeah. So you've got, let's say, somebody on the team then who is uh, – you, you, they're maybe not being openly defiant, uh, but they listen. Okay, I need to wear the helmet. And then you see this team member who's not wearing the helmet, using a word right. example. Uh, right. What's, what's next? Right. So it's perfect. So, and, you know, my, I've grown up in sales. I've worked with CEOs and sales leaders for almost 30 years see it all the time, right? And, and the reason I bring this up is because CEOs are always asking people to do things that are new for them, different for them. We're always asking our teammates, can you do this? Will you do this? One, because we see the potential in the people around us, but two, because the organization requires it. And it's much easier to ask somebody that you know, that you trust, you love, that's on your team, that you cherish, can you add this to your skill set can you bring this additional value to the organization why wouldn't i do that um it's a, it's it's natural for us all to do that but sometimes we ask folks to do things that they can't do they don't want to do they're not motivated to do so we have to be sensitive to that when i go in an organization i'm sure you see the same things to quote unquote fix a person or a situation those situations are most often caused by a leader asking someone to do something that isn't aligned with where they are, where they want to be, what vision they have for themselves. They say yes, because they feel like they have to, they're stuck in a corner and they recognize very quickly they made a mistake. And oh. so what oftentimes happens is we have, we have people, is that Chris? Oh, it's just like, oh man, I'm busting out. I mean, I'm so resonating with what you're saying. This is the, this is the life in most organizations. So when, when I, a guy like me comes in, we say, well, look, what's the disconnect? Well, this person was hired to do this role. You've added so much on top of the role, it's now shifted to become this. And you still expect that person to do this. Now they've done it over a short period of time, but that person didn't join your organization to do that. It wasn't their vision for their career, et cetera. Do you expect them to just stay there forever? This is why we lose great people. The organization shifts them. They say yes out of fear or whatever because they don't think they have a choice. And they shift in the organization. They're not happy. They move. Um, the organization isn't listening to them, isn't respecting them, doesn't care what they quote unquote want. They end up 
solving that by leaving. Yeah. Well, so I want to make a statement and tell me what you think of it. Uh, Cause this go, I mean, I love, you know, the, the way we guide people through this because we cover culture right before this. So um, if you're the leader and you're complaining about the culture and you've been there three to five years or more, this needs to do this. <laughs> right. Right. right? Well, Was it, would you agree? Well, right. And so the question, so yeah, let's say that a leader is listening right now and says, Chris, you're right. How we do just, I do We it? just lost somebody on that comment. I'm not <laughs> saying they left because of that, but maybe so. Well, nobody on this call isn't thinking about getting better, right? I mean, or in <laughs> some way, I'm sure. And forgive me, getting better. And I'm just kidding. Yeah where you are sucks. It just means how do we improve, right? Yes, yes, yes. Um, so, so it's easy. I mean, we have to default. Now, what's very popular today is this idea of a customer centric culture. Let me, I'm gonna take it back to the beginning. What the hell does that mean? A customer centric culture? Um, there's a, there's this new concept also in innovation and operations called design thinking, very similar. We're going to put the customer first. We're going to, we're going to build things that they want. It, but it also means that we're going, to, we're going to put them before us. In other words, who am I if I don't have a customer? Why should I start with what I want and then try to find a customer to buy it? Why not start with them and what they want and see if, and see if what they want is aligned with what I can bring to the table? Well, why the hell don't we treat our employees the same way? Why the hell don't we treat our team members the same way? Why do we treat our customers like customers and our team members like indentured servants? Oh, I mean, it's, that's... It just takes it to the next level. So, so, Chris, the answer is start with why would your employee change? Why change? Because they want something that they don't have. Well, by virtue of, the, of you asking them to do something like, take on a new role. Can you find an alignment between that role and what that employee wants for themselves? Could you start there? What is it that you want? When my daughter comes back to me and says, I'm not going to wear the helmet, I say, honey, I don't say, I don't force her, go to your room, you're grounded. I say, honey, what do you want? Well, what do you mean, dad? What do you want? Why don't you want to wear the helmet? I just don't want to wear it, dad. Well, what do you want? Well, what do you mean? Well, do you want to keep dancing? Do you want to keep running, having fun? Do you, do you want to protect your health? Right? There's so many examples. You know, there's a great example. If you had a $20 million thoroughbred horse, would you feed it Coke and Cheetos? The answer mm -hmm. is no. Yet we eat that shit all the time. The question is, what do you want? I want instant gratification to eat shit that tastes good. Do you want to be healthy? Uh, what do you mean? Well, do you want to live long and have a great quality of life? Sure. Okay. Maybe I'll eat Cheetos and, and Coke once a week instead of every damn day or for every meal, right? So it's, we have to think bigger. And when you start with what do you want, it puts the onus on the employee. It puts the onus on your child. It puts the onus on the customer. It transfers that work. It transfers the knowing to the the, the, the need to know to the people who do know. I don't have to make it up. I don't have to stress over it as a leader. I can ask the friggin' question. That's I can, huge. I can get the answer. And by doing so, I can now empower people with the same formula so they can do it themselves. Yeah, that's awesome. The, and that's it, the, the win circle with the right questions in the circle that you've taught us today help you transfer the the responsibility in the right way they get to own what they need to own well i think it'd be fun now to open it up for some questions um you good with that you want to do that right, let's do it let's rock it right roll. on so I, I tell you what uh i'm gonna for those that are attending and i'm not assuming everybody will want to do this if you want to get made part of the video uh chat here let me know that in the uh, in the chat box. Just say, hey, move me to video, and then I'll put you on video. If you don't want to do that, that's fine. I don't want to assume you do. 
uh, if you want to stay where you are, but either type a question or ask it. I'm going to click on allow to talk for everybody and you can stay uh, muted as much as you want. Um, so everybody, you've been made allowed to talk. Uh, feel free to participate through audio or to type it. And then if you want to be made on, uh, uh, join us by video, you can just type that in. We wanted to do this in earlier sessions. Can I confess something? Uh, we, we've adjusted to this Zoom world and we're getting there. We're getting better each session. <laughs> All right, so I'll hang tight for a second. Hey, while people adjust and type something into chat, because I know this is new and we haven't done this in our other sessions, uh, another question I wanted to ask, um, well, I wanted to first ask about the three to five year time frame. Would you have a different time frame? How long do you think someone comes into a culture before they can say that it's really their culture? Oh, wow. Um, I tend to think the first thing I tend to do when I, when I answer a question like that or think about culture is I think about brand, right? Um, a, a business's brand or an individual's brand is not something that you tell the world. You don't tell the world what your brand is. They tell you what your brand is, right? They yeah. tell you how you're impacting them. Culture begins from day one. The minute two people come together to form a team, uh, the team begins to have an identity. So it, we're, not, we're not waiting for you uh, as a leader to ask the question, whoa, like I don't have a culture until I ask the question, do I have a culture? What is my culture? You have a culture and it's an identity that's formed largely based on how you lead and how you engage your team. Um, so what we suggest to folks is that if there is a methodology that works for you as a leader, and that methodology can then be extended to create leverage among the team, amongst the team members, then it's also a methodology that should be able to um, create an identity, a larger identity, identity for the organization. One of the biggest challenges that organizations have is they, they try to create a culture that is not or cannot be supported by the team or the leadership, right? We create a vision for ourselves that we can't hope to live up to. Yeah. And right. We ahead, create sorry. the wrong direction, right? We create it and then try to live up to it instead of it being something organic. So we, this is why our methodology starts with leaders, teams, then culture, then action. We want to, we want to make sure that that culture that we end up with is something that's reflective of functional behaviors that we cultivate within our leadership team. Awesome. Okay. So and, and if people, for people here, uh, you can go back to the third session and watch that where I taught on the four actions that consistently build the culture. But, but I'm just curious for you, a new leader comes in, they're taking over a team or an organization. How long before the culture, best guess, I mean, I know it's not possible to fully flesh this out, but how long do you think it takes if that person's being intentional? Uh, well, I guess even if they're not being intentional, the culture is, how long before the culture is a reflection of who they are? Right. It's so, theirs. right. And so, so the, so let's just walk, work through this. Um, when you, anyone, every one of us on the phone today has been a new member of an existing team and we were hired for a reason. I actually was hired um, as a disruptor in an organization that was used to creating just 5% growth year after year. And they wanted to create a edge organization that would achieve exponential growth like a startup. And I was brought in to create a shift, right? So if you think about, think about the levers that you have at your disposal or that your boss has at their disposal to create a shift in a culture, at the end of the day, the, if the culture doesn't exist in the people who form that team and the way those people interact, then that the dream for that culture cannot exist. So the so one way to answer your question, Chris, is to say it, it will take as long as it takes for the leader to assemble a team that can function uh, in a way that's consistent with that with that culture. If a leader decides I'm gonna I'm not gonna change any people, I'm gonna use the same people and create this shift culture, right? I can tell someone as a coach 
um, that if your people are willing to be coached and if they're willing to embrace this vision, right, coaching can help people create a level of awareness and then create the strategies required to adjust their behavior so they can help you create this new, this new culture. If we take that approach and we don't turn anyone over, then it's going to take much longer than if we decide, okay, there are a hybrid approach. There are probably people on the team that aren't going to fit. We'll let them self-select in or out, replace them with folks who are a more natural, quote unquote, natural fit. And we can talk about natural fit when we start talking about our growth multiplier index, but a more natural fit who are going to make uh, the shift uh, uh, more accelerated. Like the organization that hired me to create that exponential growth, I had already been doing it for 15 years. More you know, easier for me to get there than transforming folks who are hired for a different reason. Yeah. Um, thank you. We had. So a, I didn't answer your question. <laughs> well, but you know, six months, I have six years. Who knows, man? Well, here's what I've noticed as a pattern, and then there's a question in the chat that we'll we'll hit. Um, Here's the pattern I've noticed. If, if you do it faster than three years, the blood that you have to spill will pretty much ensure you are the in-between leader. You will not be the leader to take it into what's next. You are the transitional leader. Uh, if you do it faster than about three years, if you can pace it and, and use like Cotter's change management process, and uh, which is like an eight stage process with an awareness of the four things that we teach, those two together. Um, you can do it in three to five years and you will not spill so much blood. You're gonna, you're gonna pay a price, but you're not gonna spill so much blood. You're gonna pay so heavy a price that you can't also lead them in the new era. Um, that is a pattern I've recognized in, in working with people, organizations, and then in my own life, because I've led a few organizations in a turnaround and I've walked into places where it wasn't my culture. And, you know, at age 22, man, I didn't know yak about any of this. I was like, oh, that's a hill. I die on hills for values. Right, uh, right, right. And made a mountain out of every, or, yeah, made a mountain out of every molehill as the cliche goes. Okay, so we got a question here. Um, this is a great process for one-on-one. -on -one. How does this work for a large group? How would you modify the process? I would not modify the process. Um, it, you know, it, and that's the beauty of that's the beauty of this. And so let's let's talk about what I mean. Um, and let's let's go back to your example, Chris. You talk about this idea of selling, right? A leader is going to sell the idea. Um, whether a leader is trying to quote unquote sell an idea to an individual or to a group or to a company, the process is the same. It's just the participants change. The complexity changes. So for example, let's say a, a CEO who is running a public company who uh, has countless fiduciary responsibilities, right? They are they have a responsibility to the board of directors. They have a responsibility to uh, the investors. They have a responsibility to their leadership team, to their employees. They have a responsibility to their customers, to the marketplace, to their, to their suppliers and partners. That CEO owes um, their loyalty to all those constituencies, uh, it, which is why they get paid the big bucks and it's why it's such a complex, complex job. It's also actually why I, I talk about CEOs and sales leaders because uh, CEOs and sales leaders have a lot in common in terms of having complex constituencies that they have to lead. They have to lead through change to growth. So if a CEO is trying to move an organization, they're still going to ask the same questions and, co and come to the same four agreements. Why change? Why now? Why do I need anything or buy, why go get anything or why acquire anything? And then, and then why, why me? Why am I the one to make this happen? Why am I the leader to make this, to make this change occur? Um, so it all starts with the why change. So the why change for an organization could be a shift, in, a competitor that comes into the marketplace and just dominates a change in technology. Uh, it could be, 
a regulatory issue that uh, makes uh, compliance very difficult and where the now the whole product line for the organization now is all of a sudden with one stroke of a pen at the at the government level is now obsolete they have to quickly shift um, and it could simply be trends that are being recognized it could be a pandemic right but the idea is that the leader even though they run an organization with maybe a thousand two thousand a hundred thousand people has to ask the same question and they have to ask that question and answer it come to an agreement with the folks who are ultimately responsible for helping them make the decision and then and then carrying forward carrying that decision forward yeah what when i speak to my daughter right the why change um creates a we would might call it something different i might it, it's an active an action a, a, an active um decision making process if i ask the question why change to a customer as a salesperson i'm actually identifying an active buying cycle is there a buying cycle because of an issue because of a desire to change that i can facilitate or within an organization i might ask a leadership team why change to move them through an active maybe investment cycle yeah in my organization well and and what for me is really you know powerful about understanding this i'm, I'm going to go micro and very meta micro uh, if a ceo can or a team leader can talk you into it really quick and easy and you didn't own it with them you can be talked out of it real fast um i worked for a leader one time i was the number two and he was very in the moment persuasive but it was also manipulative right. um, and he was very good at that and so people would walk into his office with the issue or the complaint walk out convinced that they were wrong but by the time they got to the end of the hall you could watch it on their body language they came back to their original position and felt talked out of something um and if that's if selling they, that's selling right exactly exactly i'm talking you into this and so right. what happens if they're not walking through this process they're not coming to their own conclusions and 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 here's the thing if people could get uh this this idea i think it's so huge a leader doesn't even mean positional leader it just means leader in the moment the leader in the moment is the person that sees more than anyone else at that moment uh you know so so groups don't innov innovate the individual comes up with an innovation and the group can make it better but but a, a person sees it you know and if it's the main leader and they're sharing something that they've imagined i mean leadership is sharing there's many components of it but one of it is they're sharing something that the group hasn't yet seen right then it's not going to be fully understood in fact you've got to embrace a period where you're misunderstood because their imagination is catching up to what you've imagined and at a meta level you think about like martin luther king's speech i have a dream he's imagining a civil society that's beyond what we had experienced up to that point and then what's he doing over and over in that speech he's stirring up the want he's talking about the impact he's bringing what, out the need and then taking it to the solution right you know and and i think that for me you know over and over this is so exciting because that's when they own it with us um any thoughts or comments on that and then i'll go back to questions right so to your point and that goes back to the, the beginning of the conversation so many of us as leaders show up with solutions and we present them to folks who don't really understand the problem one yeah. or who don't agree with us that there is a problem right so there's a think of any come on group in an organization that <laughs> that let, think of an it organization that says oh we need this new gadget and they go to their boss and say hey boss can we get 100 grand for this gadget and the boss is like well why the hell why what's what's with the gadget well it, do, it does these cool things and the boss is like well why do we even need it and so so much time has been wasted without without that individual uh being able to walk the boss through the process well boss look you told us that this was the vision for the organization we have to cut costs become more efficient we analyzed our group and we identified the fact that we are not efficient so we can help right and the, in fact 
we believe we want new technology that can make us more efficient. The impact of having this technology would be a 20% reduction in um, whatever, right? All we need to make this happen is some cool modifications to some platform technology platforms that we have. Here's the solution. What do you say? Now I present an argument that they can actually give me a yes or no to. Yes. I love it. Well, I want to give us some time to talk about some next steps for people. Um, and uh, uh, any other questions that pop up, I'll hit. Um, any final thoughts just on this piece, and we'll get into some next steps that you would want to make sure that you emphasize as a, just a practical takeaway on this model. The, you know, at the, at the, at the core of this model, it's not just a tool that you can go apply to make this work. we think about this idea of developing a habit, we call them winning habits, right? It's a mindset, skill set, tool set component. What we're talking about today are tools that can help us create a mindset uh, that we can leverage as a growth multiplier. This tool is not going to work if, if um, you don't have this idea in your mind or this, or this belief system that says, um, I am here to serve the folks around me. I'm here to serve my customers in a customer centric culture. I'm here to serve my uh, employees uh, in in, in a team centric environment, that level of service requires leadership. It requires this idea that um, I'm going to lead the team down a path and I'm going to make sure that my team shares my vision and is willing to walk that path with me. So you can think of it in the context of shared goals, shared path, shared vision, shared path to your point about shared, right? So it is not me as the dominant power leader that's dictating to my group. This is the first step. I have to think about my employees are volunteers. They can give me lip service like my daughter would, put the helmet on, then throw it in the woods when she turns the corner. And you guys all have employees that say yes to you begrudgingly and then ignore you when they have the chance. We all have people that don't fill out expense reports, that don't do all the simple things that we ask them to do that they say they will, but they don't do. Why? Because there isn't that agreement. So, so this is a, it's a tool set, yes, but you have to come to the table with an idea that you're gonna treat your folks as volunteers and you're gonna find that shared path and the shared goal. And if it doesn't exist, you're not gonna force it. You're gonna ask that employee what they want and if they don't tell you they want what you want, then you have a decision to make. Maybe it's the right person on the wrong team. Maybe it's the wrong person on the right team. You've got to make that's that a, tough decision. That's awesome. Thank you. And that's a perfect uh, uh, transition to what we want to tell you about. Two, two pathways here for people that have been with us uh, on this journey, whether you're watching the replays uh, or um, you're, you're here with us now. Number one, first pathway is, we're going to be inviting you to where we're making a tool live, the GMI index, the growth multiplier index, where you can figure out with this tool, where's our team, who needs to be here, who's in the wrong spot. You know, what we believe, what we see, what we know from the organizations we work with is not having an awareness of the fact that different people are activated different ways and they're focused on completely different viewpoints of how they approach their work uh, is a flaw. And it's a flaw that a lot of great tools out there that do personality stuff, you know, get you part of the way on, but they don't get you the missing components for can you really grow as much as you want. So what this index does is it's measuring, do you have the team to even get you where you want to go from a growth standpoint? So what we're going to be doing is making that tool live. We see this tool as a way that we're going to be able to help a lot of people that we may ever need, we, we may never even know. They're going, to, they're going to take this index and they're going to walk away with it and get a snapshot of where their team is. So you're going to be invited to that. Now, because you're here at these sessions, you signed up for these, what we're going to be doing is inviting you to an event that we're going to do just for you, where you're going to be able to fill it out, get an awareness of your team, and then we're going to coach you on understanding the results, what to pay attention to, what to watch out for. 
So that's pathway one. Jimmy, anything on pathway one? Then I'll go to pathway two. You got it. It's an ideal description. Dude, it's awesome, <laughs> man. I'm going to quit now. No. So, so pathway one, you're getting that just because you're here. We want to say thank you. Your attention matters. We want to honor that. Second pathway. For some of you, you've heard us talk through this, and you can tell the way that we talk through it. We're swimming in this massive lake, and we've barely given you a thimbleful. So what we put together is a 175-day journey <laughs> that over a two or a six-month process, twice a month, where we walk through all four of these components, we hit in depth how the leader changes and grows in depth what it means to get your team connected and aligned what it means that third piece to get your culture focused firing in all cylinders and what it means to get everyone engaged on taking effective action so what we did was we've got this six month process where we take you through these four parts we've gone to the studio we've recorded the videos high end quality stuff the workbook that has something to guide your team through every day of the work week, because we know the pressure and demand you're on and under, we want to come beside you and you can know because you've engaged a process, my team and I are not only going to be cared for and well led for the next six months, we're going to emerge from this with what we need to deliver to our organization, predictable growth. So you can think about all of growth multiplier, as a tool and a journey, the growth multiplier index, and then the journey that we take you on. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to send an email out as we close out this four-part series. And if any of you want to go on that journey with us, we're going to be your coaches in that. Twice a month, we're going to hop on with your team. They're going to report back on the exercises, the designed exercises that they had to work through. And we're going to coach them on that process. If any of you want to join us in that, we need to know that because as we plan out the next chunk of time calendar-wise, it's not unlimited spots. So when you get this email, and I line out these two pathways for you, if you want pathway number two, and you want to engage on this growth multiplier journey where we come beside, we teach your team, we coach you and your team on how to live this out in its depths, we would just need to know that ASAP as we make plans for what's coming up. Uh, so what I'll do real quick, any questions on either of those two pathways? And we'll be closing down here in just a minute. And if for some of you too, while you type a question out, if you've got one, if any of you are, are participating today and you're like, I need this now, we would just need to know that. So if you're connected to Jimmy and you're here because of that, or if you're connected to me, just reach out to either one of us and, um, and we'll get you taken care of. Uh, anything, Jimmy, you would add to that? either of the pathways? Yeah, I think uh, one thing that came from a previous leader that we talked to and worked with was this idea that they, th they originally thought of this six-month process twice a month as maybe being additive to their busy life. Mm -hmm. And what they realized was it was in support of their busy life, right? So many of us as leaders feel like, ah, oh, shit, I can't add another thing to my day. But what's cool about the program is it addresses stuff you deal with every day. And it, it ends up becoming uh, something that you may invest more time in, but no more time than you would normally invest in solving other challenges you face every day. And it actually helps streamline the way you process the, the data that's coming at you and the actions that you take. So it can be very supportive of you and your role versus something that's additive or maybe makes you feel like, hmm. I don't have the time to add something else to my plate. That is awesome. I'll hit that last. For people that want to take this six-month journey, here's what you can count on. Five minutes, Monday through Friday, from your team. Twice a month, they would watch somewhere between a 15 and 27-minute video with a, with a workbook that's there with them. And then twice a month, they would be a part of a group coaching conversation. That tiny of a time investment, and we know it because we see it, cuts out so much sideways wasted energy and unnecessary meetings in your organization. And this is a season right now where people want to be more aware of ever 
than how to trim the fat, but not trim the muscle, as Jimmy talked about, you don't want to do that. And then how to take those places where you can pour some gasoline on the growth. So we want to honor people's time. It's 1230. Thanks everyone for being here. Jimmy, thanks for teaching us, leading the way today. Much love to everyone. We're here to serve. You'll hear from us soon. Peace out.